Amen. You can take your seats. It's good to see you this morning. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Phil. Uh, I'm married to Claire, who was up here earlier. Uh, I'm one of the team here at Bolton. It is good to see you, to be with you. Uh, I have to confess to feeling a little disturbed this morning, maybe even a little hurt. Yeah, more than that. Because as I was uh, walking around the foyer and around uh, the hall here this morning before the service, and people noticed that I was wearing the uh, Ariana Grande headset, which obviously can only mean one thing, Phil is speaking. And, you know, I like to think of myself as you know, a, a fairly okay teacher. I've been teaching for 20 years. I've on and off been speaking in churches for far longer than that. And so I like to think I'm an okay uh, teacher of the Bible, shall we say. And yet, you know what? All of those people that came up to me this morning didn't say, Phil, I'm really looking forward to the message. I'm looking forward to the Word of God. What they said was this. Have you got any good jokes this morning? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, it is good to be here. We are in the middle, this is part two of a part three series that follows a part four-part series from a little bit earlier in the year. I hope that makes a lot of sense to you. So we are looking again at the Holy Spirit. Last week, Pastor Derek talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Nearly forgot what it was then. The fruit of the Spirit. Next week, he's going to look at the gifts of the Spirit. But today, we're going to look at the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Sam, who was up here a few moments ago, uh, before he moved back up to Bolton, was living in Watford. And a couple of years ago, it was a day, I guess, a little bit like today and the days that we've been having recently. It was sweltering. So he drove up in his relatively new car from Watford up to our house just down the road. And he came in the house in a bit of a grump, to be honest. Sam can be grumpy. Sorry, Sam. He can be grumpy, but he walked in this particular day, he was in a grump. I said, what's the matter? He said, I've driven three and a half hours with the window down. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's that hot, I've had the window down. I said, why didn't you use your air conditioning? He said, because I couldn't get it to work. I kept turning the dial up and nothing happened. So I've had the whole journey with the window down. I said, well, that's weird, because I know you've got air conditioning on your car. So I went outside, opened the car, jumped in, pushed the button, and air, on came the air conditioning. He'd driven three and a half hours with the window down. If only he'd known. If only he'd known the power that was at his disposal. His journey would have benefited from knowing that power. And that's just a story. But I, as I've thought about this subject over recent days, I ask myself that same question. Do I know the power that's at my disposal through the Holy Spirit? We sometimes sing, Mighty Saviour, lifted high, King forever, Jesus Christ. Crowned in glory, raised to life. The same power lives in us. The same power. Do we know that? Do we know that the same power, if we're a Christian today, the same power lives in us? So this morning, I want us to consider the power of the Holy Spirit. And where better else to read than from Acts chapter 2. So if you do have your Bible, uh, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 2. The words should appear on the screen behind me uh, as if by magic. Acts chapter 2, we're not going to read the whole chapter, uh, but uh, we're going to read the first eight verses and then jump down towards the end of the chapter. Verse 1, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together, that's the disciples, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears, hears them in our native language? Verse 37, Peter has spoken to the people. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Let me ask you a question. What changes have you made over the last couple of years? Perhaps you've changed the way that you do certain things. Maybe the things that other people used to do for you, you're doing yourself. I used to go and get my hair cut at the barbers. There wasn't a great deal to it, as you can see. But I used to go and pay somebody to do my hair. One or two other brothers in the room with the same hairstyle this morning. Peace out there. <laughs> but I was paying, I don't know, eight or nine pounds every time I went. And it came to lockdown and I had a decision to make. Could I adopt Pastor Derek's hairstyle? Or could I shave my hair myself? Or at least get Claire to do it for me? And so we invested, and it's been the, one of the best investments ever. Almost as good as my conservatory, but not, not quite as good. I've saved myself a fortune, but it's because I've got somebody else. Rather than getting somebody else to do it, we've sort of done it in-house. Maybe you've made changes over these last couple of years to the way that you work. Perhaps before, maybe some of us can't work from home but maybe those of us who do now work from home thought why on earth didn't I think of this before it's just so good I'm saving myself so much time so much fuel and all those other things we've made changes to the way that we interact I don't think I'd ever heard of zoom about two and a half years ago and now it's zoom it's teams uh, it's skype it's all these other things that we find ways of interacting some people are always looking for ways to improve or to change their life for the better. It might be that you use anti-wrinkle cream. I don't know. It might be that you've had, we were talking earlier, people who have that many Botox injections that their face doesn't move when they talk. I don't know if that's you. What is it about you, perhaps, this morning that you would like to change? Maybe it's something to do with the way that you look. I may have said it before, but I lost about a stone over lockdown. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe you want to change your level of expertise around a certain subject. I don't know. Has anybody maybe learned a language over lockdown? I don't know. Begun to. Pastor Derek, what is it, Pastor Derek? Mandarin. I thought maybe English would have been a good option, to be honest. Ooh, ooh. Ni hao. Yes, very good. Chicken chai rice. But whatever changes we make, let me read you a verse. I'll stick to my notes. There's a famous verse from Hebrews 13, verse 8, which says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ is the same 
yesterday and today and forever. But you know what? While God is unchanging, his character doesn't change, but God is always on the move. God never stands still. God is interested in change, and he's interested in changing you and me. And there are certain things that God wants to change about you through the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. I had the privilege a few weeks ago of uh, speaking to our Gateshead campus. Uh, I was talking again about the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I said to them was this, that I grew up, I was incredibly privileged to grow up in a Christian home. I was taken to church every week from as young as I can remember, as young as I was able. And it was a great church with great people, with great tradition, with great teaching. But there was one thing that was missing. We never really talked about the Holy Spirit. He was a little bit like that uncle that you don't really talk about very much. The one when it comes to a wedding, you think, do we really have to invite him? And that's what it was like. The Holy Spirit didn't really get a mention. But something in me, in that respect, had to change. And I suppose I wondered what I'd been missing out on. Let's have a look at what happened to the disciples that we read about this morning. They'd spent three years with Jesus, but they were still pretty confused about many things. They didn't fully understand the purpose of Jesus coming to earth. They didn't understand his mission. I think some of them were still wondering if Jesus was just an earthly king. They were confused. They were timid. Just a few weeks earlier when Jesus was arrested and subsequently crucified, many of them had done a runner. Peter was questioned as to whether he knew Jesus or not. And he even said, I don't know this man. He, was un- he wasn't prepared to admit that he even knew who Jesus was. At that point, the disciples probably weren't that confident about sharing the message of Jesus with other people. And at the end of the day, if they didn't fully understand it, they'd have struggled to, to share that message anyway, wouldn't they? And when you read the Bible, when you read the New Testament, you see all of these occasions where Jesus tries to spell things out to the disciples and they still don't get it. He tells them about things that are going to happen and they just seem to be oblivious, they're unaware as to what's going on. Just before he returned to heaven, Jesus had told them about the Holy Spirit coming shortly afterwards. Acts 1 verse 8 says this, But you will receive power, Jesus talking, when you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Pentecost came, and these events that we read about this morning suddenly unfolded. A crowd had gathered, as it said, from all over the the world, the known world. And that crowd listened as these disciples preached the gospel of Jesus to them. Peter stood up and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he preached. And 3,000 people came to Jesus. All of that through the events of one day, of one moment where the Holy Spirit came on those disciples and gave them power. Suddenly, that confusion had gone. Suddenly, that timidness had gone. They were bold. They were confident. They immediately understood that message, perhaps, that they'd struggled with before to fully understand. And as we just said, look at Peter who just a a month or two earlier wasn't even prepared to say that he knew Jesus. Suddenly leads 3,000 people to Jesus. He's speaking to the crowd with a confidence, with an understanding that he'd never had 
before. Let me read you verse 3 again. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. As we'll see later, there are many different uh, pictures and symbols of the Holy Spirit. And one of them is fire. And fire has the ability to change things. My mum and dad, some of you may have seen this week on social media, celebrated 60 years of marriage. I don't know which of them deserves the medal. But 60 years is an incredible achievement. Uh, I was, or rather, they'd been married about 30 years when they had me. No, that's not true. But 60 years of marriage. But it's not all been plain sailing. One of my earliest, probably vivid memories was from about 47 years ago. Uh, I'd been invited round to one of my friend's houses for tea after school. And I can remember playing outside in the street and both of us smelling fire. It turned out that that fire from a couple of miles away was my mum and dad's business burning to the ground. And they were inadequately insured on the business. And it, all of a sudden, it was worth pretty much nothing. I asked my dad permission to share this. And he said it was almost an obsession that he wanted to be financially secure. That he wanted the best for his family. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when it came before his relationship with God. That's when it became dangerous. It had become an obsession to him. I want money in the bank. I want security with my family. And dad will say to this day that whilst he doesn't believe God spoke to him in a, an audible voice, he did press on him the importance of having that relationship. That God was instead saying to him, I'm your security. I'm your foundation. I'm your strength for life. And from that moment, whilst my dad carried on with the business and it was hugely successful, it was never an obsession. And actually, I don't remember it being an obsession. My dad was never a workaholic. I never saw him bringing a lot of work home. But that fire changed things. In the short term, it was probably seen as a negative. But in the long term, that fire had a huge impact. Fire is powerful. It's powerful. As I said, it is incredibly symbolic as well. Over time, it's come to symbolize many different things. Passion. Desire. Rebirth. Resurrection. Eternity. Just to name a few. But fire is also the symbol of transformation because fire changes whatever it touches. And you know, the Holy Spirit took fishermen and tax collectors. We talked about one this morning, didn't we? Claire did. He took ex-religious leaders, former prostitutes and various family members of Jesus and turned them into a united group that we call the church. Before Pentecost, those disciples were scared. They lacked faith. They didn't understand the plan. But after that fire fell, they were united as never before. It was the fire, it was the power of the Holy Spirit that changed their lifestyles, their attitudes, their priorities. And this morning, I wonder, are we willing to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. There was another change that took place on Pentecost, a very spectacular change. After Peter preached that message, 3,000 people responded to it and came to faith in Jesus Christ and were baptized. One day, 3,000 people. We don't know much about these people, we do know that Jerusalem was packed with people because they were celebrating the Feast of uh, Pentecost. 
If you look back into the Old Testament, Jewish tradition taught a couple of things about Pentecost. It was the day that commemorated God giving the, the, the commandments to Moses, giving the law to Israel. And so sometimes the Jews would call it the season of the giving of the law. But it was also an agricultural festival. God had told the Jews to gather in Jerusalem 50 days after Passover to celebrate the harvest. It was one of the three official feasts that called the people of Israel to worship three times a year. For Israel, it was a harvest of grain, but this particular Pentecost was a great harvest of the Spirit. Jews from all over the Roman Empire came. 3,000 of them who weren't Christians, who didn't believe in Jesus, were changed. Again, through what? The power of the Holy Spirit. And their whole way of looking at God and looking at themselves, looking at the world, looking at eternal life, everything had changed for them. The Holy Spirit was the one who changed those 3,000 people. And now those people knew the way to heaven. They knew peace with God. They knew Jesus was their saviour. And everything that happened on that day of Pentecost can be summed up in that one word. Change. We see the change that took place in these disciples. Just ordinary people. And look at what the Holy Spirit did. We see the change that took place in those 3,000 people all through the power of the Holy Spirit. Over time, I've seen people respond to an invitation to follow Jesus. And maybe in the moment, it was genuine and it was sincere and it was meant. But maybe because of the lights or a song or the, 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 the atmosphere, atmosphere of a moment... It didn't last. It wasn't really a lifetime commitment. But you know what? For these people that we read about, their changes weren't just what we might call sometimes a flash in the pan. Look at what happens next in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, all, not some, not a few, it says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's the first verse after the one we read. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. As we said earlier, our world has gone through so much change, particularly in these last couple of years. Changes in technology, changes in the way that we do things. And change is often scary. You might like change. I struggle a bit with change. I like to know what I'm doing. I don't like to change from it too much. But you know what? Our world today needs change of another kind. Our communities need change. It's great to hear what's happening in our community. Our community needs change. Our families need change. And there are so many people that I know, that you know, that need that change. People who don't have faith in Jesus. And how many of us are like those disciples were at the start of that reading that we, we read this morning? Timid. Weak. Maybe a little bit ashamed. A little bit embarrassed to share stuff with people. Maybe that is true of us. I don't know. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, changed those disciples who were despairing, who were fearful, 
into dynamic people of God, dynamic disciples. They received that power and their lives were transformed. The power of God and energized them to be unique, be incredible witnesses of Jesus Christ. At Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit came directly to those disciples. And you know what? He can do the same for you this morning. But he might do it in a different way. Back in the Old Testament, let me read a couple of verses from 1 Kings 19. Elijah needed to hear something from God. 1 Kings 19 verse 11 says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. This morning, the Holy Spirit could come to you quite dynamically through the sound of wind, through tongues of fire, maybe through the words of a song that we've sung, maybe through the, the, word, of, uh, the word of God, maybe through something I'm saying. The Spirit can come in the spectacular but he can come in the simple too. And on the inside, all kinds of change can happen. The power of the Holy Spirit can change us daily. And I want to think of a few ways that he can do that as we draw to a close. Maybe he can give us boldness. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of what? Power. Say it with me. Of power, love, and self-discipline. Maybe the Spirit enables us to be at peace with God and ourself. Maybe he's there to give us clarity when we read the Bible. It's interesting, isn't it? In 2 Timothy 3, 16, when it says, All Scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice that in that translation it said God breathed. If we look back to the Old Testament, the Hebrew word behind spirit is ruach, which means air in motion. It's the same word for breath. But it also means life. By resembling breath and air in motion, it means spirit. And that's where we get the translation. And the Hebrew word contains all of those different meanings. But in other words, when God breathes his word to us, it's there to change us. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to breathe life into us. Just think about that for a moment. When we read his word, his breath, his life is coming into us. He makes us complete. He transforms us. He changes us. Maybe the Spirit is there to give us a greater understanding of God. Maybe He's there to enable us to share our faith more effectively and more confidently and more naturally. Maybe He gives us strength and power to be able to live the way God tells us to live through His Word. I love this translation from the message Romans chapter 8, verse 15. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's Spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who He is and we know who we are, father and children, and we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. This morning, do you want to change? Do you want that 
power from the Holy Spirit? Do you want to let him do what only he can do in your life and mine? To allow him to fill you afresh. To allow him to turn you into the person that God has called you to be. Those disciples, as we said earlier, were pretty ordinary. Fishermen. What do we say? Former tax collectors. Religious leaders. And through this small group, that message of Jesus traveled throughout the whole of the Roman Empire. They preached. They taught. They healed. They demonstrated love in synagogues, in schools, in homes, in marketplaces, in courtrooms, in streets, in hills, in ships, on desert roads. Wherever God sent them, lives were changed through the power of the Spirit. God takes ordinary people like them, but like me and you. He takes ordinary lives and makes them extraordinary through the power of the Spirit. And yet, as we said at the beginning, the same power lives in us. If we know him, the same power lives in us. What needs changing? What do we need to change this morning? Maybe it's our attitude. Maybe our attitude is not what it should be. Maybe it's our habits. Maybe we've got into a rut of doing the same things over and over that we know we perhaps shouldn't be doing. Maybe it's our relationships. Are we spending time with the right kind of people, those iron sharpens iron sort of people? Maybe it's our motives. Maybe it's our priorities. Maybe this morning you don't know what it is to be changed. Maybe as you've listened to me this morning, you're thinking, well, I don't know Jesus. I don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. How can I be changed? Well, you know, it's really simple. God can change you this morning, but you have to be willing to accept him into your life. Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago for a purpose. He came to die to put right for all those things that you and I had done wrong. And Jesus died a death that he didn't deserve. Jesus took the punishment for the things I'd done wrong. For the things that you'd done wrong. And not one of us this morning can say we've never got anything wrong. Just one, one wrong thing, one wrong sin as the Bible calls it, would keep us out of heaven. But God didn't leave us to it. He sent Jesus to die in our place. To take the punishment for us. And this morning, you can be changed through the cross of Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just a simple prayer to acknowledge that you've done the wrong thing. And to accept Jesus in. But you have to want to be changed. You have to ask him. You can do that this morning. We can all be changed today because of what the Holy Spirit can do in us. Are we prepared to allow the Holy Spirit to make those changes that we need to? I'm, I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a song together. And during that song, I want you to use that song as your opportunity to respond. Let's be dead honest this morning. Because God knows anyway. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. But be honest this morning. Say to God, that needs to change. I can't do it myself. But with your help, with the power of the Spirit, I know that that thing can change. I know that I can change. So let's pray. In fact, why don't you stand with me? as we pray and then as we sing.